I think the public are getting rather tired of me after all these years. I've been overworking myself. He planned a year's complete rest from music. But a serious event put the London Philharmonic Orchestra into liquidation and also put paid to the holiday. The outbreak of war. I heard there was a state of national emergency, so I emerged. <laughs> he did not leave England until the spring of 1940. There is only one man to lead our country at this time of crisis. He has done it before and he can do it again. And the name of that man is Lloyd George. The next day, Winston Churchill became Prime Minister. <laughs> In Australia, a BBC radio reporter was assigned to interview Sir Thomas as soon as he landed in Sydney. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Sir Thomas. I've been asked to conduct an interview with you over the wireless. Delighted, my dear fellow. Have you talked over the air before, Sir Thomas? Uh, no, I think not. Ah, well, then perhaps it would be sensible if we were to practice, you know, rehearse a Oh, little? I think not, I think not. I much prefer just to improvise. You ask me any questions you like, you know, just to say anything you want, just to get me going. After all, my dear fellow, it's me the listeners want to hear, isn't it? <laughs> And so we went on the air without rehearsal, without preparation of any kind. Australia waited for a feast of wit. Now, Sir Thomas, you are about to conduct orchestras entirely strange to you. Tell me, do you believe in the old saying that there are no good or bad professional orchestras, only good or bad conductors? What precisely do you mean? <laughs> Well, um, I, I was asking if you believed in the saying that there are no good or bad orchestras, only good or bad conductors. I, I believe it was Von Bulow who said it. Was it really? Mm. <laughs> uh, do you intend to conduct much Mozart? Well, whether I conduct, to use your phrase, much Mozart depends entirely upon the condition of orchestras here, about which I've received no information whatsoever. <laughs> I, um... I, I... I believe you intend to include some Berlioz. Quite possibly. <laughs> and Delius? Well, I see no reason why not. <laughs> Could I ask... You know, you're talking too much. <laughs> Great deal too much. It's me the listeners want to hear, you know, not you. Now, please, try not to interrupt. Sir Thomas. Thank you, my dear fellow.
Many of Australia's best instrumentalists were away at the war. In Brisbane, Beecham rehearsed the prelude to Tristan and Isolde in a schoolroom. A greying lady led the cellos, a music teacher. She drew her bow passionately, but her tone was excruciating. Madam, you have between your legs an instrument capable of bringing delight to thousands. <laughs> and all you can do is scratch it. Sir Thomas didn't really like to have women in his orchestras. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Here, please. I didn't mean it. It wasn't that he objected to them on musical grounds. He simply maintained that if they weren't good-looking, it upset his players. And if they were good-looking, it upset him. <laughs> on one occasion after a concert, he was visited in his dressing room by an extremely attractive young lady who asked if he would do her the honour of becoming godfather to her child. Delighted, my dear. But why bring God into it? <laughs> this from the man who married three women and had famous liaisons with others. At the end of the war, Beecham and his new wife, the pianist Betty Humby, returned to England in a Dutch cargo boat. As soon as he landed, Sir Thomas was run to ground in a Liverpool barber's shop. He was asked what he was doing there. I always come to Liverpool for a shave. <laughs> The restrictions of wartime England proved no obstacle to Sir Thomas. One afternoon, a certain Dr. Hunt was sitting in his consulting rooms in Sloane Street when the telephone rang. Dr. Hunt, this is Sir Thomas Beecham speaking. You don't know me, but I am in urgent need of your professional services. Kindly drive at once to my home, number 143, Hamilton Terrace, Northwest 8. I shall be much obliged. Reluctantly, the doctor cancelled his appointments and drove to St. John's Wood, where he was astonished to find Sir Thomas in full evening dress and apparently in the pink of condition. Dr. Hunt, I presume. But Sir Thomas, I understood you were ill in bed. My dear fellow, who said anything about my being ill? In point of fact, I'm due to conduct tonight at the Royal Albert Hall. No, my difficulty is how to get there. Due to petrol rationing, my car is immobile. <laughs> Taxis are unobtainable. I have appealed in vain to the fire brigade, and public transport is out of the question. Doctors seem to be the only people who can move around nowadays. <laughs> now, on your way back to Sloane Street, you will pass directly by the Royal Albert Hall. I shall be most grateful for a lift. <laughs> I don't know that if you and your wife are fond of music, in case you are, here are two tickets for the concert tonight, and I hope that afterwards you'll be good enough to drive me home. <laughs> Beecham got his lift to the Albert Hall. Dr. and Mrs. Hunt went to the concert, drove him home afterwards, stayed for supper, and remained close friends for the rest of his life. Despite the war, Beecham was still full of ambition for British music. I'm going to found one more great orchestra to round off my career, my fifth, the Royal Philharmonic, which is going to be the greatest orchestra ever. People always tell me I will not get the players. I always do. I get the finest players in the country. They're so good they refuse to play under anybody except me. Sir Thomas, I have heard that you are occasionally conducting from a score these days. Yes, but I don't like it. A score at a performance gets between the conductor and his orchestra. Short circuits personal rays of influence. Do you think there will always be audiences for live music? Oh, yes. Yeah. Don't neglect the receptive power of the audience. I never fail to consider it. I don't agree with Mahler's maxim that if a slow movement's not going any too well, then play it even slower. No. <laughs> if I sense any tedium or lack of interest in the audience, I quicken the tempo, play it a bit louder. Never conduct over an audience's head. It's an impertinence to do that. Besides, there is the not unimportant question of whether the music is beginning to bore me. If it is, very well. I just go ahead and get it over with as quickly as possible. <laughs> Illness forced Lady Betty to withdraw from the concert platform. And in 1958, just as he was about to begin a brilliant season in Buenos Aires, she suffered a fatal heart attack. Beecham was brusque with sympathizers. I don't want sympathy. I don't want all that guff. I just want to be left alone. On his return to London, a man who knew him by some extraordinary mischance had not heard of his bereavement. Sir Thomas, oh. how good to see you again. And how's Betty? She's on tour with Vaughan Williams. <laughs> he was a comedian, or as this is a term which the English associate with red-nosed buffoonery, I had better describe him as an artist in comedy. 
but he was not a wit in the epigrammatic way of Oscar Wilde. Sir Thomas indulged not so much in wit as in waggery. He was not 18th century in manner in the least. He belonged entirely to the 19th century. <laughs>